Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Thomas. I am co-founder and director of GMO Free New Jersey, a New Jersey nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to educating the public about genetically engineered foods. Uh, my name is Keith Monahan. I'm on the board of directors for GMO uh, Free New Jersey. And today we're going to give you an introduction or sh hopefully short lecture on um, GMOs. So um, how many here read, show of hands if you don't mind, uh, read labels on the back of food products and anything? So a good deal of people, that's good. All right, so what is a GMO? GMO stands for genetically modified organism. And what does that mean? That means that the, uh, and this is according to the World Health or uh, Organization, that a, the organism has been engineered in such a way that it cannot occur in nature. That means that it has to be created in a lab. It's not something that can be created in your backyard. So DNA is um, artificially um, inserted into the lab, and they take different traits, sometimes from different organisms, um, cross species barrier and so forth, to create genetically modified organisms. A lot of times people confuse hybrids with GMOs. Hybrids don't fall into that category because hybrids are something you can create in your own backyard. You can take two different varieties of tomato and you can um, take the pollen from each and you can create your own hybrid. You can't do that with a GMO. Um, and like I'll say several times throughout this presentation, if you can create it in your backyard, it's not a GMO. If you uh, can create it in your backyard and it has to be created in a lab, it's a GMO. So what traits are in today's uh, GMOs? There are two uh, common traits that are in most of the genetically modified foods that we eat, and they are herbicide tolerance and pesticide producing. Herbicide tolerant plants are created in a way so that they withstand um, otherwise lethal doses of herbicides. And um, so and they, you, they say herbicide resistant, but that's kind of a misnomer. Tolerate is better because the plants don't do too well, but they tolerate just enough so they don't die themselves. And the other type is pesticide producing. That means every cell of the plant is genetically altered in a way that each cell produces this pesticide. So this is how Roundup GMO corn is made. Um, they take DNA from the bacteria, specifically Bacillus thuringiensis, which is used in organic agriculture, but they take a truncated um, form of the bacteria and they insert it into the corn. And when the corn grows, every cell of the plant creates this pesticide. This is a picture of how they splice the genes together. Um, so it's very, again, I don't think anyone could do this in their backyard. So what are you eating? This is you. Okay. So how did GMOs get into the food supply? This is a chart showing graph from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization showing numbers of people that are undernourished in the world. GMOs came on the scene in 1994. So you can see from the line on the graph <clears throat> that actually between 90 and 95, there was a little bit of a, a decrease in human hunger. And look what happens after 1995 all the way up to 2009. One in seven people in the world are hungry and one third of our food is wasted like that that this is a bigger problem than su food supplies. Our earth makes enough food to feed all of the people on it. In 2010, 160 billion dollars worth of food ended up in dumpsters, which is uh, more than the gross domestic product of Hungary. So the real problem with, with feeding the world is lack, poor distribution of the food, lack of access to arable land for the people who want to grow it. Most of the GMOs today are being fed to livestock and uh, being used for biofuels for cars and, and vehicles. And um, we, right now, on this earth, produce twice as much food as we need for the number of inhabitants that we have. 
So another way that, uh, G another promise made by the biotech industry was we will create foods that have special qualities, high, higher nutritional value. So they came up with this product called golden rice. And golden rice was supposed, they, they said that it was supposed to feed uh, people in countries that were vitamin A deficient. And vitamin A deficiency can be a very, very serious problem in parts of Asia and Africa. And it can cause blindness. And it's a very serious problem. Um, unfortunately, golden rice has never been proven safe. It has never been proven to even work. They did one human feeding trial with five people, and they could not even determine that the, that the vitamin that the vitamin A would be assimilated into their bodies. Um, when the first version of golden rice came out, they had um, I think a, a pregnant or a nursing woman would have to eat something like seven kilos of the rice in order to get the right amount of vitamin A. The reality about vitamin A and the, the, the real solution to that problem would be to take a tiny fraction of the hundreds of millions of dollars spent on this product development and to invest it into the people in these areas, teach them how, how to garden, teach them how to grow sweet potatoes, and, and uh, green leafy vegetables and other foods that are more natural for them to eat anyway. Um, I really personally believe that expecting people who aren't even in a rice growing area to eat buckets full of rice is treating them like livestock. And I think that that is just wrong on a very basic level. So here is a picture of children, Ugandan children eating sweet potatoes. It would take like a, a few teaspoons of sweet potato to give a child their daily quota of vitamin A. Another promise of the biotech industry is they would create these tomatoes that would uh, be high in anthocyanins, uh, which is like an antioxidant, and uh, purple, the purple tomato, and uh, they have not been proven safe to eat. And these tomatoes were grown by my friend Keith Monahan. And there are many, many other breeders who are working on developing through natural means tomatoes that will have high levels of, of antioxidants, like the blueberry, you know, the blue foods. And um, so that is. That is a beautiful thing. And I think that we have all the resources we need to develop these foods naturally. So with all of that, these broken promises or promises that didn't come through, how did this happen policy-wise? How did they get by the vigilance of the FDA, the organization we have come to know and trust to take care of the food supply? Well, there is a rule at the FDA called GRASS, generally recognized as safe, which, which states in its law that any food that was shown to be safe up through 1958 would have been grandfathered in, you know, sugar and salt, things like that. Grandfathered in, generally recognized as safe. But I just told you, the GMOs didn't come on the scene until the mid-90s, early 90s, you know, but, but in the food supply in the mid-90s. How did this qualify for grass status? Well, I think we're going to find out here today that grass might stand for something else. It might stand for government's reprehensible approach to safety. Because what happened at the FDA, I don't know, it shocked me when I found out because I was always raised to believe that the executive branch of the government and their um, administrations would, would had some responsibility. But the FDA, right around um, between like the 1990 and 1992, they hired a man named Michael Taylor, who had previously worked for Monsanto. Anyone know, ever hear of Monsanto? Monsanto is the world's leading um, supplier and driver of the biotechnology agricultural uh, uh, market. They make the Roundup. 
that uh, Keith told you about. And um, so, so Monsanto, so Michael Taylor worked for Monsanto. Before that, he worked for the FDA. Then he comes back in the early 90s to the FDA again, and he establishes this policy called substantial equivalence. So the, that policy states, and that's not law like grasses, it's just a policy, but that if, if an inventor of a seed comes to the FDA and says, this year of corn is genetically engineered, this year of corn is not, if, if you cannot tell the difference with your five senses, they will deem it substantially equivalent, put it in the food supply without any testing, without any requirement for pre-market testing, without any regulation, and without labels specified that it would not be, need to be labeled. So um, Michael Taylor's not the only one. Here are a few of top appointed officials who worked for Monsanto and worked for the federal government in some capacity. Does that look substantially equivalent to you? You've got an ear of corn, so you might not be able to tell the difference with your taste buds or by smelling it or by feeling it or by listening to it. <laughs> but the GMO ear of corn has pesticide in every cell. I don't find those substantially equivalent. And neither do the squirrels. A farmer named Paul Fonder set this up. And an astute high schooler uh, last month said, hey, but the organic corn's taller. That's why the squirrels went after that. You know what? He had a really good point. But once it started to get eaten away, if a squirrel's only going by sight, they would go for the other one, the whole one, you know, that has more kernels on it. So, so then they leave the FDA office and they go right down to the patent office with their substantially equivalent ears of corn. Well, they threw out the organic one. And they said, this, these seeds are unique. They have special properties. I want a patent on this life form. So the, the reality is you might be eating your patent pending corn. Who owns the contents of your digestive system? So the FDA is not responsible for making sure your food is safe. That's up to Monsanto. That's what the FDA says. But Monsanto was quoted in the New York Times as saying, Monsanto should not have to vouchsafe the safety of biotech foods. Our interest is in selling as much of it as possible. Assuring the safety is the FDA's job. But again, the FDA only requires, and it's not even, it's an optional Option is not even a requirement. The companies that produce the seeds can do testing, present them to the FDA, or not. It's optional. That's the only testing that's, that's done, 90 days studies. So which genetically engineered crops are engineered? So, so we found out that the companies that produce the food are not responsible for the safety. The FDA is not responsible for the safety. Anyone want to take a guess as to who's responsible for the safety of our food? You are. We are. We have to be responsible for the, for the safety of our own food. So we, we know that. So let's do it. So the first thing you might want to do is learn which crops are genetically engineered. So memorize this with me. I promise I'm only going to get you to memorize five words. S, C, 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 right? Soy, corn, cottonseed, canola. Just memorize it. Anything that comes from those plants, oils, a lot of oils, uh, but, but soy and, and corn are in just about everything. So be, when you read your labels, SCCC, soy, corn, cottonseed, canola, or vegetable oil that's not organic and not non-GMO project verified is going to be GMO. Okay? Add another S at the end. So ready? Soy, corn, cottonseed, canola, sugar beets. Hey man, they've got us. They have really got us. <laughs> they, all the good stuff, all the commodity crops, plus the sugar. 
So most of the sugar comes from GMO sugar beets. If it does not say cane sugar on it, it's from, it, from sugar beets. And if it's not organic or non-GMO project verified sugar, it is GMO sugar. So here are the crops. Um, they're up there for you. But there have been a few more added since this chart was made. We also have, um, oh, oh, no, there's, there's something else that you should know. Because it's not a crop. Um, this stuff. It's called aspartame. The little pink packet is not that. It's, it's, uh, it's NutraSweet equals Splenda. It's from aspartame, which is E. coli waste. It's produced from E. coli waste. And um, very, very, a lot of really serious neurological problems are connected with aspartame. We have a couple of other um, things that have been added. But, um, in the produce aisle, uh, you saw up there that, that sweet corn was added. A very small amount of yellow, zucchini, yellow squash and green zucchini, summer squash, and um, alfalfa that goes into animal feed, and papayas. So, was that all, all of it? Oh yeah, and now potatoes and apples were just approved. The potatoes will be in this next growing season. They'll be in restaurants, they'll be in, in uh, supermarkets unlabeled. And mama always said, you are what you eat. Well, guess what? You are what that which what you eat eats. <laughs> so animals that were fed GMOs, factory farmed animals, any meat, cheese, eggs, dairy that is not labeled organic was fed GMOs. Unless you really know your farmer. You know, if you know your farmer, they're not certified organic, but they can assure you that that animal was fed non-GMO grain, then, then you're, you're okay. So what is the impact on the environment? What is the impact on the environment? This is a chart showing the, um, the blue line is the introduction and the uh, usage of glyphosate, which is the uh, primary ingredient in Roundup. So the more Roundup we use, You'll notice the red line is the uh, rise of superweeds. And superweeds are uh, plants that um, become resistant to Roundup. So after a few sprayings, they no longer die from being sprayed with Roundup. And unfortunately, they grow much quicker than um, anything else that we plant. Um, like, let's see if there's a picture. This is a picture of pigweed amaranth. And it can grow up to a foot a day, a foot a day. It outcompetes anything else that we're growing, and unfortunately, it's not edible. I mean, if it were, we could grow this, and that would be fantastic. But because of the uh, usage of Roundup, we're getting um, resistant uh, weeds that we have to use more toxic chemicals in order to combat them. Uh, it's an, hopefully, we don't get to that point because that would be a scary uh, position. And then we, because um, it's very difficult to find a picture of any super pests, so we use this instead. So the crops that are, have been genetically modified to produce pesticides in every cell of their body, like Roundup corn, um, Bt corn, excuse me, it's Bt and Roundup ready. But Bt corn, when an um, insect that would eat it, that we don't want to, when it bites into the corn, um, it ingests some of this Bt toxin and its stomach explodes and it kills the pest. So every part of the corn plant will produce this pesticide. Well, unfortunately, what's happening is um, insects have a much uh, quicker gestation period we do, and they go through many more generations than humans do because they have a short lifespan. Some of these insects are becoming um, resistant to Bt. So now when Bt is sprayed on our, when they eat these crops, well, they can eat them all day long. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and that creates a huge problem because now we have, uh, we're going to have to use more toxic chemicals in order to kill these insects. And because we're spraying Roundup, and we're spraying Bt, and we're spraying all these toxic chemicals, we're killing pollinators, we're killing butterflies, we're killing bees. We need these insects in order to pollinate our plants because about 60% of the produce that we eat is pollinated by bees. If we don't have bees, you don't get to eat the majority of the foods that you like. You don't get your almonds, you don't get oranges, you don't get a lot of the food that you would normally eat if we killed the bees. Another problem with GMOs and the impact on the environment is um, there's no biodiversity. So this is a, a beautiful picture of a farm that has many different crops, and this is like a polyculture type of uh, 
environment. And this is good for the environment because the more variety there is, the more insects, beneficial insects, you may have some um, uh, uh, nasty insects in there as well, but you have a, a, a more cohesive ecosystem, which is good, instead of this. This is a monoculture and it creates huge problems. So there's a lack of biodiversity when it comes to GMOs because as Barbara said, there's um, soy, corn, cottonseed, and canola. And do you know how many varieties of co uh, soy, corn, cottonseed, and canola there are? There's not many. There's two varieties of corn that are genetically modified. There's one variety of soy and one variety of cottonseed, that's it. There are no other varieties. So there's very few varieties when it comes to GMOs. And um, this is another problem. Pollution. Uh, it's also a problem with conventional agriculture, but more so with GMOs because you're contractually, the farmer's contractually obligated to spray Roundup repeatedly as per uh, the instructions on the bag. So more of this stuff is going into our waterways. Um, it also creates um, pesticide drift. Um, they spray it and that'd be fantastic if it just stayed there. Um, it's the reason why we have no smoking in restaurants anymore because they thought the whole policy, there's a no smoking section. But the smoke won't drift over into the non-smoking section, so that's okay. But we know that that's not true. Smoke drifts, so do pesticides. And they go onto organic farms. They go into your yard, to your uh, house, if you live close to a farm. Another problem, specifically with glyphosate, is it's, um, it's a broad-spectrum chelator. And what that means is that it molecularly binds um, minerals in the soil. It hugs them, and it makes them unavailable. That's actually how it works. It makes these minerals unavailable to the plants. And because they don't have these minerals, they die. And unfortunately, it kills the soil because the minerals aren't available for anything. They're not available for any more plants. They're not available for insects. They're not even available for bacteria that's in the soil. So this is what happens um, when we use this kind of um, uh, technology. We kill the land, we kill the soil. And by killing the soil, we kill earthworms, which are very important to gardening as well. Um, I'm a gardener myself, and I get excited every time I go in and I dig something and I see my uh, uh, topsoil is full of worms, because that means that they're eating um, anything that's fallen in there, and they, um, worm poop is actually a very good fertilizer for your plants. So by killing them off, you're actually killing off extra stuff that the plants could use. FDR said, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And um, we're probably not too far off from there because we are destroying our soil with uh, conventional agriculture and genetically modified agriculture. Another problem with the GMOs are they're supposed to remain contained, but they don't. It's very easy for bees or other pollinators to take that pollen and that genetically modified pollen and bring it over to, if you're an organic farmer, to bring it over to your field and contaminate your crops. Um, wind, like as you saw the picture of the pesticide drift, wind is another thing that brings um, pollen from GMO crops to non-GMO crops. Um, so it doesn't stay contained. Once it's been released, it's, it goes all over the place. Um, and they promised us that that wouldn't happen, but that was another one of their wonderful lies. So you saw the impact on the um, environment. So what is the impact to the farmers? This is a um, seed bag of genetically modified seed. I'm not ex sure what kind, but this is the contract that's on this side of the bag. Once you open the bag, you agree to the terms of service. And the terms of service usually for that are you, once you grow this crop, you're not allowed to collect the seeds afterwards and save them and plant them next year. We've been doing that for thousands of years. That's the way we traditionally do farming. We take the best possible crops that we have and we um, save them, we let them dry out, and we save those seeds and we plant them next year. You can't do that with GMOs. Once you plant them, you sell your crop, you have to buy another bag from them. So once they have you into that and you can't save your seeds, what do they do? They raise the price of the bag. Another problem is, say you don't need uh, the glyphosate or the Roundup because your crops are doing well. Well, according to this contract, it doesn't matter. You still have to spray it. You have to spray it at least, depending on the contract, up to four times in the growing season, whether it needs it or not. So you're unduly um, spreading um, pesticides when you may not actually need it. So the saving of the seeds you can't do, there's a rising co uh, cost. There was the choice I told you about because there's very few varieties. So farmers don't have the biodiversity to, to plant, um, like say heirloom tomatoes or like golden beets or red beets. They wouldn't have that option. It's whatever they have in the bag is what you plant. 
Um, that's not good for the uh, environment. It's not good for the farmer because it uh, reduces his choices. The other problem um, for the farmer is cross-contamination. Uh, now, if you're an organic farmer and you happen to be anywhere in the vicinity of a GMO farm, if your fields become contaminated, you, you can be sued um, by Monsanto because it's considered patent infringement because you're now growing um, genetically modified seeds, even though you had no intent of growing them, and you can't save your seed. This is if you save the seeds. You can't save those seeds because they're now contaminated. Now, Monsanto is nice enough that they will come in and, and clean up your property for you, but what about all that crop? I could have lost $10,000 on a, a field of uh, corn I was growing that was organic because I can't sell it now. I can't do anything with it. And, um, and if your uh, crops do become contaminated or you're growing genetically modified, a lot of countries don't want genetically modified organisms. They will send them back. So from an economical perspective, we are, uh, it's a very short window, very narrow parameter of things that we can sell, and fewer and fewer countries want what we have to sell. So the health effects of GMOs, we have no idea, folks. There have been no peer-reviewed ind independent studies. All, in addition to that contract, they're not allowed to, those farmers are not allowed to give those seeds to any scientists because God forbid that a scientist, an independent peer-reviewed scientist would do a lifetime study. It actually did happen with uh, Dr. Seralini in France. He did a lifetime study of rats. He actually based his study on Monsanto's 90-day study. I don't have slides for this. I'm just going off on a branch here. But um, he based it on a Monsanto study because Monsanto themselves found liver and kidney toxicity. So Dr. Seralini said, I want to find out more about that organ toxicity. I'm going to do a lifetime study, use the same kind of seeds, the same kind of rats, right? But for two years, the whole lifespan of the rats. They came up with multiple massive tumors, early death, particularly with the female rats, early death. And um, he wasn't even looking for cancer or tumors. He was looking for organ toxicity. Um, it's a long story, and we could probably talk a whole hour about that. But we won't. So um, how do we find out, how do they find out if a food is safe before it goes into the food supply? They don't. Well, let's just put it in the markets and we'll find out in five or ten years. So basically, today's crops are using a form of genetic engineering that was developed 20 years ago. It's an outdated form of the use. Uh, an outdated use of, the form of genetic engineering. It is based on a one gene, one trait mentality. At the time that these things were developed, geneticists thought that 75% of what was inside a DNA molecule, they actually termed it junk DNA. It was only in the fall of 2012 that they started saying, uh-oh. <laughs> Every single, every single gene, every single, every aspect of the DNA molecule has a purpose. Wow, that's a surprise. Are you surprised? I'm not surprised because I think we know from common sense that everything's there and working and functioning synergistically. So there was no, no attention towards synergistics when doing this this kind of genetic engineering. Totally mechanistic, materialistic science. Old science, and it is not, this is this, uh, Dr. Vrain used to be, uh, he, he used to be working for the biotech industry, and then he realized that this is uh, a disaster waiting to happen. Okay, so effects on the organism. Keith talked about the Bt toxin. The reason that it gets into the insect and, ex and, and uh, explodes their stomach is that it has uh, these sharp proteins, cry proteins, and um, it is, it's able to get through the cell walls of the bug's digestive system. Well, we are starting to see that this Bt toxin can go through the food into the human gut and possibly 
cause holes in the human gut. Ever hear of leaky gut syndrome? Guess what? 20 years ago, I never heard of it. Didn't hear about leaky gut syndrome 20 years ago. Glyphosate. I've got to talk about glyphosate because it's my favorite topic. <laughs> the word chelate, chelator, you might have heard this big fancy word, it, it chelates, it's a chelator. It derives from the Greek word for claw. So that might help you understand how the, the glyphosate grabs hold of the minerals. Every single mineral in the, um, in, in, in the, that, that's available. So uh, I jumped the gun. These ch this chart, we have a whole stack of charts like this. I don't want anyone to leave this room and think that I'm saying this is causation. These charts that I'm going to show you are correlation. It's not causation, correlation. So we're not saying glyphosate caused autism. We're saying that, look, from 1995 to uh, 2010, that, see the yellow bars? That's autism. And the red line is glyphosate use. So look at it yourself and see what you think. Um, diabetes, intestinal infection. Remember the, um, the way the horizontal gene transfer of this special gene going into the human body, into the intestines. Alzheimer's, deaths from Alzheimer's. Hypertension. Now this chart has a, one, a line that the others didn't have. You see the green line? It's a nice straight line, uh, straight diagonal. That is showing the pre-1995 trend. So if we were going along, not considering anything else, just looking at the previous data, that is where we would expect hypertension to go. Every one of the charts would have a green line too. You could see that. You could see that it was pretty low up until 94, 95, and then it, it skyrockets. So, um, this, getting back to glyphosate. So it chelates the minerals. It bonds the minerals in place so that the plant, this is just, I love this picture just because it shows the interrelationships of all the different minerals, micro and macro minerals. So every mineral is available to be bonded and made unavailable. But they're making a particular, this came from a, um, a website of horse, uh, horse people, people who are feeding their horses and being really careful about what kind of feed they're, and they looked into the GMO feed and they saw that their horses were having problems, mineral deficiency problems. So they, they uh, put this out, the manganese and the interrelationships with phosphorus and calcium particularly, they did, they're not, that's not shown on this chart, but you know, you can imagine the people who were selling the beef from the cattle, they're not going to be so concerned about this and what they feed their cattle. Because the cattle, the age that they go to market, is so young that it's, it's, be, you know, it's not even relevant. They're not showing any kind of symptoms. But these horses would because they're, they, they, they want to keep them alive longer, right? So this is just uh, a, an interesting bar graph to show. On the left, you see the root uptake. This is from the same site, actually. And on the right, you see transported into the plant. So the solid bar uh, represents the, the controls. And the, uh, the bar to the right of the solid bar is with glyphosate. So with glyphosate in the roots, you can see how it, uh, the diminished returns. And then with then, of course, if it's only going to get that much up into the roots, what's getting up into the plant? Well, not much at all. So basically, the animals and people who feed upon these plants are not getting the minerals. And guess what? If it's a problem for horses, it's a problem for us too, to not get the right nutrients. Um, uh, glyphosate is a known endocrine disruptor, and there is no known safety. There's no safety uh, level for endocrine disruptors. Um, oh boy, 
Glyphosate was also patented. When the patent for chelators started to run out, they patented it as a pharmaceutical anti antimicrobial drug. So this glyphosate that is being applied to our food in the millions, hundreds of millions of pounds, is a pharmaceutical antibiotic type drug. Now, here's another one of those, it's not rocket science, folks, moments. We know that long-term, low-dose consumption of antibiotic-type drugs leads to antibiotic-resistant diseases for which we have no treatment. Do we all know that? If you didn't know it before, you know it now. And that is just a fact. It's the way evolution works, and it works much faster for uh, microorganisms than it does for the human being, right? We take a long time to evolve. So antibiotic resistance. Is glyphosate a, car is glyphosate a carcinogen? Wow, that's heavy stuff because when I go into the, the committee rooms trying to get labeling over in Trenton, the biotech scientists, scientists walk in and say, I would drink glyphosate if you gave me a glass of it right now. I heard this. <laughs> I heard this. Didn't we hear it? Yeah. I would drink it. It's safer than table salt. Well, guess what? Glyphosate is a carcinogen. It has been shown in vitro to, um, to create, to um, proliferate estrogen receptive breast cancer cells. Now, in vitro, again, don't misunderstand me and think, you know, that they did this study in a human being. But you know what? Guess what? Human beings can have cancer cells floating around at any given time that, don't, that aren't ever going to hurt them, ever. Add glyphosate into the mix, what are we going to have? Now, overall, if you look at the history of breast cancer, you will see in the United States, breast cancer has gone down. So I might have just blown my um, little fact here. Not really, because... Generally, breast cancer has gone down, but estrogen receptive breast cancer has arisen in our country. So that is definitely something to look at because it's not, it's defying the odds. If the general numbers are going down, then it's probably risen more than, than, we, than it should. And it might indicate something like this. We might be able to make a correlation graph there. So, um, I don't want to get to that yet, but uh, I just want to say that the last couple weeks of March were pretty bad weeks for Monsanto. <laughs> and I usually, I, I'm not usually into like a, uh, what's that word, that German word, schadenfreude? Is that? Is yes. <laughs> schadenfreude. I, I don't usually take pleasure from the, mis from the, the, the misery of others. Okay, so I have bad news. Monsanto had a couple of bad weeks in March. Well, there were studies released, peer-reviewed studies, that antibiotic resistance is linked to glyphosate. Now, scientifically, now that they've figured that out, we can say, oh, yeah. <laughs> We all knew that anyway, didn't we? And um, they also said that it is another study came out like the next day uh, connecting glyphosate to the manganese depletion. Manganese, an essential mineral that we all need, right? And then the who, and I'm not talking the group. I'm talking about the World Health Organization there's their IARC, uh, International Agency for Cancer Research, came, they reclassified glyphosate as a probable carcinogen. So we don't want to drink a glass of glyphosate, right? So um, this is all really, again, not to take joy in someone else's sadness, but it's really good for us and our food supply that uh, this news has come out. So let's just see, before we get on that, we talk about Monsanto a lot, and I just want to clarify, people ask us why we pick on Monsanto, and um, 
probably not within the last two years, but before that, Monsanto owns 98% of all of these GMOs, and they are the largest biotech company. So when people ask us why we specifically pick on them and why we don't pick on DuPont, Bayer, Syngenta, or Basif, it's because Monsanto owns 98% of the market. I, I just want to clarify that. So legislation. This is a map of the world, and you see all the green check marks. There are 64 countries that either ban outright or require uh, labeling for genetic genetically modified organisms. If you'll take a look, you'll see that the United States and Canada do not. Um, and why would we? Because we're the uh, birthplace of where they uh, take place, and we produce the most of them. So that's why we have no labeling whatsoever. Um, state legislation. Um, Connecticut was the first state to pass uh, GMO labeling legislation. Unfortunately, it has trigger clauses. They need um, adjacent, is it four adjacent states? Uh, four other states, one contiguous. Contingu uh, yeah, one contiguous. So one contiguous. adjacent state, and then four other states have to pass legislation before theirs goes into effect. Maine has similar, Maine passed legislation, and they have similar um, uh, restrictions as well. And then Vermont is the first state that has a labeling bill that um, actually has teeth to it. There are no restrictions to it whatsoever. So congratulations, Vermont will hopefully will be the first state to uh, label genetically modified organisms. Why hopefully? Because they're currently being sued by the, uh, the Groceries Manufacturing Association um, because they feel that it's going to impact their profits in other states. So we're it looks promising for Vermont, and we think that they will win um, that lawsuit. But as, if they win that lawsuit, then their bill will go into effect, and it will become law for the state of Massachusetts. Rhode Island and Massachusetts also have um, bills that are coming along, which are um, look very good. Um, ours, meh, but uh, it's New Jersey for you. And then federally. So this is uh, a graphic for the Dark Act, which is deny Americans the right to know. That's not what it's called on the federal level, but that's just so you guys can remember it. So Mike Pompeo, um, Indiana or Kansas. Kansas, representative from Kansas introduced the bill. And if this bill gets passed at the federal level, that would make GMO labeling um, voluntary. And it currently is voluntary. And they choose not to do it. But it would supersede states' rights, and they would not allow to label GMOs at all. Um, it would be illegal to do that because it's it's, this is codifying volunteerism a, as part of GMO labeling. We don't want that. We want to label GMOs, and we want to label them at the st uh, state level. And if we can't do that, there is a federal bill, the, um, the Boxer DeFazio bill, which gi will give us mandatory labeling, and it will give us at the threshold that we want, um, which is 0.9%. Is that correct? Yeah. And this is you. I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the hidden costs of cheap food. Well, you might say, well, gee, the food is so cheap. It's so inexpensive, right? Well, guess what? You already paid for it in your tax dollars. That's why these are the billions and billions of U.S. dollars that go to subsidize GMO crops, not organic crops, GMO crops. And guess what else? You go to the cash register and you can pay for, for the, the cheap food. It's already cost you in tax dollars. And after you leave the cash register, it is going to cost you in health, vitality, doctor's bills, drug bills, and quality of life. I wasn't going to go further than the hospital. <laughs> but um, we do know what happens eventually. So um, and the other thing is that I think is worthy of mention. Um, that prior to, let's say, World War II, about 30%, 30 to 35% of a person's or a family's food budget was spent, I'm, I'm sorry, a family's total budget was spent on food, OK? And around the world, it's pretty much that. Around the world, it is like 25, 30, even 35% in some countries of the total budget is spent on food. Does anyone have any idea what it is here in the United States today? The percentage of income spent on food is, we don't have a grand prize. I guess that's why the hands aren't shooting up, 7.5%.
that's not a good thing. And, and when, you know, when you, you might hear, you know, policy people might say, oh, wow, can we get it down to four? I think that that shows really crummy priorities. If that's how much we value our food, why? I mean, that kind of explains that map Keith showed you about us not having labeling or regulation of GMOs and the rest of the world because they care about their food. Food is important and the quality of it is important and what it goes through to get to us is important. So the good news, I thought you were gonna do this part. No, that's you. <laughs> the good news is that when 5% of the population rejects GMO foods, I just saw a really neat infographic. It was just this morning or we would have put it in here. <laughs> but it said something like 4.2% of the foods of, of the most recent years were spent on organic. So we're getting close to 5%. When 5% of the population pushes back against GMOs, they will stop forcing them onto our plates. That's called the tipping point. If you ever went into a playground and saw some children playing on a seesaw, and these two kids are exactly the same weight, right? That seesaw is not going anywhere, is it? It's just like horizontal. But then when the little, little sister runs across and jumps on one side, tip, there it goes. And the thing that's so great about that is that somebody in this room might make the purchase, the purchase, one little container of yogurt that causes a tipping point. And I think, for me, that's why GMO Free New Jersey exists, is because we had that concept. My, my uh, co-founder and I, we read the, you know, we talked about it and said, oh my God, do you realize? It's just one purchase. If you just change one purchase. So that brings us to the, to how to avoid. You might say, oh well, I would like to avoid. I would like to make, you know, better healthy decisions for my family or myself. Uh, but I'd also like to contribute to the tipping point a little bit because this thing's big. You know, we're in this together. You can look for the non-GMO project verified seal on foods. Has anyone ever seen this before? Yeah, so it's a third party verifying company and they make sure that there are no GMOs in, in the uh, products. You can look for USDA organic or you can look for both. Um, so then this, this really gets us down to the point of, of what can we do about this whole situation. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> so as Barbara said, so we have the, the tipping point. Um, you make the one purchase. So obviously this is to illustrate that your money does talk. Your money is very important. What uh, a lot of consumers don't realize, we are the largest group we have the most, if we all banded together, we would have the most power to do anything about that. And how do we do it? We vote with our dollars. So you want to make sure that if you want to avoid GMOs, you are voting with your dollars. Your money is speaking for you. When you go and you purchase a product that's organic or non-GMO, you are telling manufacturers, I don't want that. I want the organic product. I want the non-GMO product. I do not want your GMOs. I do not want this crap that you're peddling. I don't want it. And the fewer people who buy that, the more likely they are to stop producing it. So there are a couple of organizations, uh, companies that you could shop at, supermarkets. So this is Trader Joe's policy um, that they, they do promise that they have no genetically modified organisms. They're not third party verified. Uh, just in their line. Just in their, their line. their label. Right, the jo Trader Joe's label specifically. They're not third party verified. However, we've had a few of our um, members actually take their products and send them to the labs that tested and they're pretty much they're non-gmo so we've we've been verifying them for them but they won't um they won't go through third-party verification for whatever reason costs money it does cost so. a lot of money and then whole foods 2018 2018 has promised um that they would remove all either have labeled or remove all genetically modified food from their stores so those are two possible places that you can shop at um if they're if, if they're around here and i do know that um sometimes that's I don't really like to uh, promote them specifically because you might live in an area where you don't have access to a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's. Because um, let's face it, in the United States we have a two-tiered food system. Um, the, uh, 
the people who are privileged or wealthy enough can afford to shop at Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. And we frequently are told this by legislators. You have an organic label and you have non-GMO project verified. Why do you need this other label? You can go by that. And to me, that's a slap in the face to someone who works minimum wage and is making ends meet and can't go to a supermarket and pick something because these products don't exist in their local market or their bodega because the, and there's no labeling. So they're forced to eat this crap because the rich people and the people who are privileged enough can go shop here. Um, to me, that just that's an affront to people. We have a two-tiered two food system, and it's a food justice problem to me. And that's what, one of the reasons why I became involved with this organization, because I think it's unfair that some people do not have access to this food, and everyone should have access to good food. So here are a couple of other places that you can, um, is products you can buy, you can eat. Um, there's Elevation Burger, Chipotle, um, Ben & Jerry's are free of GMOs. And then if you know your local farmer or your uh, uh, farmer's market or something like that, go there. Buy fresh, buy local. Local is probably one of the most important things you can do because if you get to know your farmer and you know where your food comes from, you're probably going to have a better relationship with what you're putting into your body and you'll probably know whether it's GMO or not. And um, other than sweet corn and the zucchini and yellow squash, there aren't too many vegetables that are genetically modified. And one other thing you can do, no matter where you live, plant a garden. Even if it's a little container on the side of a wall and you're growing Swiss chard or some spinach or whatever, um, maybe you want to grow flowers for pollinators because maybe you don't have a really good uh, green thumb to grow vegetables. But um, maybe you have a nice little oasis and you have a couple flowers for pollinators to uh, come and eat um, on their little journey from yard to yard. But no matter where you live and where you are, there's probably some way for you to plant a garden. In my personal, um, for me, every time someone plants a garden or plants a seed, um, it's like they're uh, uh, thumbing their nose at Monsanto. Because Monsanto's whole objective is to own the entire food supply. That's what they want to do. They want to own the food supply, and then once they own it, they can sell as much as many chemicals as they want, as much of it as they want, and then you're forced to come to them. So every time you plant a garden, plant a seed, do anything, it's an act of disobedience toward Monsanto. And it shouldn't even be an act of disobedience. It's your uh, uh, God-given birthright to grow your own food, to know where it comes from, and to have a nourishing relationship with the earth. Uh, do you have anything And join that? us. <laughs> join us. Join us on Facebook. Uh, contact us. or We have information here to contact us if you wanted us to come and and speak at your pot, non-GMO potluck party so that your friends could stop hearing you talk about GMOs. We'll come and talk about GMOs. <laughs> so, you know, we, we'll just go anywhere in the state to um, educate people. And But the Facebook group really is great, not just the public page, which we'd love for you to like. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the group itself is a really good place to kind of um, Go a little deeper. Go a little deeper into some of the topics about of GMOs. Anyone? Anyone have questions? Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Do we have time? I don't even know what time it is. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, does GMO have any correlation with um, celiac disease or, or uh, gluten sensitivity? What a great question. We actually skimmed over a really important topic because we only had an hour in here. Um, <laughs> We put up the organic and we put up the non-GMO project verified. Some people think the non-GMO project verified symbol is a better product than the or organic. Organic is the top tier, okay? This is a terrible, terrible thing. But we found out about eight months ago that Monsanto has been pushing farmers, not just GMO farmers, but farmers of wheat, beans, peas, oats, um, sugarcane, uh, a bunch of them. We're still on the learning curve. But not, they're not genetically engineered. But guess what they do a week before harvesting those things if they're not organic? They, they dry them down with Roundup. They spray the crop. So wheat, I used to, we used to be able to say to people, we thought we could say, go ahead, wheat's not genetically engineered. Go ahead, sugar's not genetically engineered. You don't have to buy organic. Guess what? If you want to avoid glyphosate, which we have found 
is a mineral chelator, an endocrine disruptor, and a probable car carcinogen, right? Then you need to eat organic wheat, organic beans, organic oats, organic sugar, period. And there are others that we're working on finding out. So um, celiac disease. The question might be, so did, did, has anyone ever heard of celiac disease prior to 1992? I hadn't. I'm sure it was in existence, but um, it is off the charts right now. And the human being is about 10% human being cells and about 90% gut microorganisms. So glyphosate, so, so Monsanto said, don't worry about it. Glyphosate doesn't bioaccumulate. It goes right, and, it, and it's only, it only, you know, it only kills these plants. It doesn't have any impact on human cells. But we're 90% microorganisms that are affected by, by this chemical, this toxin. It goes in and indiscriminately, in fact, it kills all the good organisms and allows some of the pathogens to thrive. So knowing that the gut microbiome is our first line of defense for our immune system, what do you think? What do you think might happen? How many uh, celiac disease people or gluten, gluten insensitive people have gut problems? Huge, always. Oh, same with autism, by the way, you know, with that one chart. I don't, don't want to make too big of a link there, but there's, there are people doing really good work in that department. So are you allergic to the wheat or are you allergic to what's been done to the wheat? And it's not to say there aren't people who are officially celiac and it's life-threatening and they will, you know, I, I have a real respect for the, the, the folks who are really basically the canaries in the coal mine. That's what it is. Any other questions? Is that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, it was late coming in, but when you see organic as a label, USD organic, I've heard mixed results, uh, mixed reports of whether or not that encompasses GMO. Um, if, if, it, if it has earned the USDA certified organic label, it may not, they may not knowingly have GMOs in it. I, I, I feel terrible to put the word knowingly in there, <laughs> but, but it really depends on how often those crops are tested. Whether, you know, whether there are stray, whether there's been contamination of some sort, but they're not allowed to have, that's your best bet at this point. Well, the best bet is growing your own food. And I, you know, obviously we can't grow all of our own food, but I, my philosophy is since knowing Keith, my gardening guru, cause I'm a beginner gardener, it's like if you've got an old shoe that you're ready to toss out, put some potting soil in it and grow something and hang it off the wall. It's really, it, you know, even if you're growing a tiny percentage of your own food, it is so empowering and, it, and it, it's really life changing. It's really life changing. A teeny little, make a little basket of greens for a salad. On that note, maybe you can answer this, Keith. So what would you use as a natural pesticide to keep it organic? Um, you probably shouldn't have to use pesticides. Depends on what you're growing. Um, um, there are some pesticides. There are things, people use things like neem oil or they might use water and then um, like a biodegradable soap. But if you're using good practices in your garden and you have flowers and you have vegetables and you have biodiversity, you're going to have beneficial insects in your garden. Um, I don't know, we don't have a picture of it because it's not really part of GMOs, but um, I'll say, take tomatoes for ex uh, example. A lot of times people are plagued by hornworms, which are these uh, big fat green caterpillars that will devour a plant, um, couldn't devour an entire plant in an evening if they have the time. And if you've ever seen any that have like these little white things sticking out of uh, their back, those are eggs from a parasitic wasp. And I get two hornworms a season maybe, and I leave them because they're always filled with parasitic uh, wasp eggs that will devour the uh, caterpillar. And I don't have a tomato problem because I grow flowers that attract beneficial wasps that will eat those insects or do damage. So if, when you go from a whole perspective instead of 
That's the problem with monoculture. You have huge, vast fields of wheat, and you don't have anything else for these other beneficial insects to eat. So they're like, why do I want to go over there? There's nothing in that wheat field for me to eat or for, for me to do anything. So they don't do anything in that field. That's the problem with monoculture, and that's, that's the problem with even organic, um, conventional, or GMO. We grow huge fields of one particular crop that's not healthy. Biodiversity is the key to having a garden that doesn't have problems. So I grow a variety of different things, and that combats most of my problems. But if you occasionally there are some crops that you grow that are a problem, um, like maybe some of the cabbages, because cabbage moths are horrible, especially where I live. So you may either net them, like so a mechanical um, thing is probably your best bet. So you don't have to put anything um, potentially toxic on there. But they do sell some things out there. I try not to use them. Because I figure this way, if I have a problem, the cabbage moths are eating my cabbage, then I did something wrong and I need to get more beneficial insects and I let them eat the cabbage. Because I do not want to introduce any kind of chemical into my system because I want to eventually have it be self-sustaining. And, and if you can, you know, a beginner gardener might have more problems than Keith does. <laughs> Pick me. But, um, you know, you adding good quality soil amendments to your garden, like if you're a beginner and it's like, oh, man, you know, I'm having this problem, then that problem. You know, so over time, adding, you know, getting your composting skills built and adding all, you know, don't let one leaf get dragged away by a municipal truck. You, you, you get them on to back into your ground. You know, Keith taught me that too, um, that you're just, you know, you're amending your soil and eventually you're gonna find that beautiful, sweet balance. And guess what? It's the same thing as what happens in this gut microbiome that the human being has. It's a balance of microorganisms. It's a synergy. It's this incredible dance of, of you know, balanced dance. So any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. I hope that if you have any other questions or interest, you'll get in touch with us. Thank you.